morning. You know, in the last class, we talked about the word detonation. And what did we tell? Supposing we have an explosive gas mixture in, let us say, a container, and instead of igniting it, and how did do how do we ignite? We deposit some heat source, lay a, a spark, some something which is hot. The heat from the source goes and heats the neighboring gases and chemical reactions occur, it heats the neighboring gases and so on, a flame. Maximum velocities are of the order of a meter per second, that is the rate at which the flame propagates out. If the same energy or some energy is deposited, let us say impulsively, by impulsively, what is it I mean? Sort of spontaneously, that is over a very short period of time and we have already learnt about it. When some energy is deposited in a medium spontaneously, what happens is a shock wave gets generated and this shock wave keeps decaying with distance. Like for instance, I form a shock wave of a Mach number m s. This is at point 0, maybe at point o, which is the 0 scale over here. x axis is the distance. The Mach number keeps decreasing with respect to time. And we told ourselves, well, a shock wave is formed under certain conditions if some energy is deposited impulsively. And if chemical reactions, if the, the shock wave propagates, let us say, in the same explosive medium in which a flame propagates, what is going to happen? You are going to have chemical reactions taking place behind the shock wave. And this chemical reaction is something like which is energizing the shock wave. And this shock wave actually decays with time because it is getting, it is some dissipation is happening, some expansion processes are happening behind the shock wave because of that the Mach number decreases. But if this energy balance or the chemical energy which is released is able to overcome this decaying influence, well, instead of the Mach number decaying, well, it could move at a constant velocity. That means, I have a shock wave which is moving at a speed greater than the sound speed. And mind you, the pressure density increase behind the shock wave. This increase, increased pressure, the increased density is now propagating at supersonic speed and this is what we call as a detonation. That means, a shock wave induces chemical reactions and this chemical reactions in turn drives the shock wave and this particular sequence namely a shock forms chemical reactions behind it and this chemical reactions drive the shock in turn is what we call as a detonation. A detonation can propagate under steady conditions provided the losses incurred by the shock, let us say the blast wave due to expansion behind it may be due to the dissipation effects. If the energy release can overcome this, it can travel at a constant speed, let us say d meters per second. This d meters per second happens to be a large number because shock by itself travels at a high velocity greater than sonic speed and if by chemical reactions it can be made to travel even faster and therefore what is going to happen? Let us re redraw our figure now. You have m s that is the Mach number of the shock as a function of r s. You have a blast wave which is being formed. It keeps decaying with distance. Let us say by some distance I have I am able to form sufficient chemical reactions and let us say it is able to form a shock wave which is traveling at a given Mach number and this is what is a detonation. That means till here the you have a decaying shock wave. The decaying influence is overcome by chemical energy release and you get a detonation. Therefore, a detonation is a combination of a shock which induces chemical reactions and this chemical reaction in turn drives the shock and this constant velocity is often spoken of as chapman jugge velocity. We will come back to it. Now, if, if we are very clear, therefore, now we say well, a detonation is a shock wave in which maybe chemical reactions are induced and the combination of the shock with chemical reactions is what we call as a detonation. I think we have to be a little more clear about it and we have to distinguish it from a flame. Well, in a flame, it is the transport of heat, transport of concentration from the source which really propagates a flame. That means something heats it, you have something like an ignition kernel and this kernel must be of some minimum size such that 
the heat loss within it is able to uh, overcome, is able to uh, cause chemical reactions in the adjacent layer without itself collapsing. We said ignition kernel size must be greater than the quenching distance. So also, can we say something about the energy requirements to form a detonation? Mind you, we are very clear, these are two different things altogether. In, in a mixture, which is let us say an explosive gas mixture or you have an explosive substance like let us say TNT or some liquid explosive, I could form when the energy is liberated slowly, I could form something like a flame which travels at maximum a few meters per second. I could also form a shock wave in which chemical reactions occur behind the shock wave and I could form a detonation. Principally, both are totally different in that this is compression because behind a shock wave you have compression. In this case, we found it was an expansion. Therefore, these two things are totally different. But let us go back and find ourselves. If I can imagine something like an ignition kernel for forming a flame and we know how to estimate the minimum ignition energy, can I go ahead and write out what is required to form a detonation? What energy release is there? If the energy release is let us say impulsive or spontaneous, how much energy is required? Let us go back, let us address this problem, it is quite simple and what we say is well, now I say I deposit some energy E naught in a particular medium and what happens? A blast wave is generated, let us say along the distance R s, it could be any, si any, any direction. We again confine ourselves to assumptions that we are talking in terms of a spherical wave which propagates out and we say well, I deposit E 0 joules over here. Well, I say I have already done this problem as regards the blast wave formation is concerned. I have already done this earlier and what did we find? The Mach number of the blast wave is related when the wave is strong. Mind you, I do need a strong wave because I want chemical reactions to occur behind it. I know that yes, m square is equal to 1 over 4 pi i into gamma into 1 over r s by r naught cubed, where r naught is the explosion length r naught which we explosion length which we defined as E naught by P naught to the power 1 by 3. Therefore, according to this, well I have drawn this earlier, again I draw it, let us say m s as a function of r s by r naught, what is going to happen? It is going to keep decaying with respect to time. But now we tell this energy is deposited in an explosive medium which can sort of burn and therefore, what is going to happen? Well, I have, I have the shock, initially the shock is strong, the shock keeps decaying in strength, maybe initially the Mach number may be 8, 5, 6 and so on, it ultimately decays to an acoustic wave and in these regions I know how to estimate the temperature behind the shock front. Let us estimate one or two cases. We know, well the density behind the shock to the density ahead of the shock if we go back and just check ourselves, we know S is equal to gamma plus 1, where gamma is a specific heat ratio, gamma minus 1 plus 2 over m square plus 2 over m square. We will we'll forget this because we are talking of a strong shock solution. We say, well, I want high temperatures, therefore, I am really not looking at the value of the Mach number because the Mach numbers are high, 2 over m square is equal to gamma minus 1, let us put it down 2 over m s square, m s square is, is large therefore 2 over m s square is small compared to this number therefore I can write it as gamma plus 1 divided by gamma minus 1. Similarly, I write that the pressure behind the shock divided by the initial pressure of the medium, mind you I say that the pressure of the explosive gas is P naught, the density is rho naught, the temperature is T naught to begin with, it is unburned medium. I can write it as equal to, we again go back to gamma, gamma plus 1 into the Mach number square minus, you had gamma minus 1 divided by gamma plus 1 and we said well for shock, this is a strong, for a strong shock, for m s being large, this is small, for m s being large, this is small. Using these ratios of the density, let us say, what did we say therefore? We could create a blast wave, behind the blast wave, I am able to estimate the density, I am able to estimate the pressure behind it. Using these two relations and using the gas equation P is equal to rho RT, 
I get that the temperature behind the shock to the temperature ahead of the shock is equal to it is ambient temperature let us say 300 Kelvin. I can write it as equal to P s by P naught into rho naught by rho s and I can estimate the temperature using these two expressions I put one on top of the other and for a temperature T naught for the different values of m s over here let us say typically strong values let us say yes I consider the m s values I can estimate the values and let us put these values in the form of a small table over here. What is it I am going to plot? I am going to plot Mach number m s and how the temperature behind the shock changes. Well, if I consider a somewhat weak shock let us say the temperature behind the shock. If I consider let us say a weak shock and what is it I get? I get if the shock is weak let us say 2 the temperature estimated for m s is the only variable for air gamma is equal to 1.4 the temperature is around 500 Kelvin. When the Mach number of the shock is 3 the temperature is 805. When the Mach number is 4 m s is 4 the value is 1210 Kelvin. When the value is 5 the Mach number is 5, the temperature is 1740 Kelvin and the last one let us say at a value of 6, Mach number is 6, the temperature is 2385. You know we know that when the temperature rises to a value around 1500 to 1600, you have auto ignition of the gases taking place and therefore I can say well if the Mach number of my shock is such that its value is greater than a between 4 to 5 let us say, then chemical reactions will spontaneously occur behind it. Therefore, if I have to generate a shock whose Mach number is let us say greater than around 4 that means greater than this limit, well I can form a detonation. I will tell myself well there should be something like a critical Mach number which I can say is M s star critical and it is the duty of the energy which is liberated should be able to form a shock whose Mach number is let us say greater than equal to between 4 to 5 in most explosive gas mixture. If I have an explosive gas mixture which, which auto ignites at slightly is let us say 1000 then it could be between 3 and 4. If I have an explosive gas mixture which is so inert or something which does not ignite spontaneously but which ignites only around 2300 well the Mach number should be 6 and therefore maybe on an average it is between 4 to 5. And therefore, I can tell myself the duty of the ignition source is to generate a Mach number O which is greater than this. But how do I do this? You know, I would like to define something like we were able to say when I have a flame, what did I tell? Well, I wanted an ignition kernel, I wanted a kernel of flame, an ignition kernel whose size must be greater than or equal to the quenching distance for a flame to get started. Can I also say for a detonation, what is that minimum volume? Can I talk in terms of a detonation kernel or a seed which is required detonation kernel which is required to start off a detonation? And if so, can I say what must be the minimum size of this? Just like I say minimum size of a flame kernel is the quenching distance what should be the minimum size required. And I would like to spend some 3 or 4 minutes on this because this will give us an idea on what are the type of energy which is required and we will be able to calculate the energy required for a detonation to form. Therefore, let us spend some 10 minutes on this or 5 minutes on this and try to proceed further. Well, we have already said the Mach number in case I am talking of a medium which is not explosive. Let us again put a medium over here. This medium to begin with, let us say it is at an initial pressure P naught, density rho naught, temperature T naught and let us say it is inert and therefore I know that the Mach number of the shock which is generated, I just wrote the expression, let us write it again 1 over 4 pi I we said is an integral constant which denotes the ratio of the kinetic energy of the shock medium divided by the kinetic energy if the entire medium were to move at the shock speed 4 pi i gamma into 1 over R s by R naught cube. But here you know I also have the explosion length and I am interested in some energy which is liberated E 0. 
If I want to put E0 explicitly and I want to form the value of ms as a function of only rs and not rs by r0 for different values of the energy release E0, well for one value I get a curve over here, I increase the E0 significantly and then I get another curve over here. If I increase the E0 still more, I get the third curve over here. Therefore, the, the direction over here is in the direction of E0 joules over here. Therefore, this is how a blast wave decays as it is formed by energy release in an inert medium. Now, I make this into an explosive medium and this explosive medium has the say let us say same pressure, same initial pressure, one atmosphere pressure, same initial density and the same initial temperature let us say 300 Kelvin or so. And now what is going to happen? Well, a strong shock is formed let us say the, the level I am considering energy release corresponding to the white line over here. And what is going to happen? Well, as it propagates out now the shock is strong let us say the Mach number I, I denote m star which corresponds to rapid auto ignition of the gases behind the shock I form a shock wave. The temperature behind it is T s, we have already estimated the value of T s. We said M s is between 4 and 5 and the temperature here is quite large such that chemical reactions are occurring. Therefore, in this particular zone of gases which are above this, I expect chemical reactions to occur behind the shock for all these three cases. White line may be the, the particular line here, may be the line over here. But now, if I say well, you know these chemical reactions however spontaneously they occur will take some time to take place. That means, you know even though I create a shock wave, the time for chemical reactions is not instantaneous. It will take let us say a microseconds, maybe 10 microseconds or let us say a millisecond. Therefore, this will take place only when the shock has traveled a particular distance. That means, by the time a particular that, that means a blast wave is formed, it travels a particular distance from the source and by the time it travels a particular distance maybe the chemical reactions should have started taking place because we say well there is a characteristic chemical reaction time and mind you in addition to characteristic uh, chemical reaction time we found that there is a large induction time mind you let us let's, let's again go through this. We told ourselves for most of the explosives the activation energy is large and how does the uh, chemical reactions occur with respect to time? Let us say this is the energy release. Initially there is an induction time in which the chemical reactions get, get ready, chains are formed and once the chains are formed I have a rapid one. That means I have something like an induction time which we call as induction time followed by the chemical reaction time and this is going to take some time and therefore, maybe by the time the shock travels at certain distance the induction time should be over. So, that the chemical energy gets released and the shock that means there is a need to have a minimum value of R star that means a minimum distance and this minimum distance perhaps could correspond to what we are looking for namely a detonation kernel. I think we are still not too clear about it, but let us let us presume that yes the chemical energy must be released in the medium by, by the time the shock because if the shock let us say if we take another instance if the shock were to decay to this particular value well be, below this the chemical reactions just take too long a time well the shock cannot really convert to a detonation. Therefore, by the time the shock strength reduces to a critical value m star, it should have moved a particular minimum distance which I can call as a detonation kernel. Maybe I have to refresh this definition again, but for the present I say it must move a minimum distance away. And this minimum distance away is necessary to form a kernel of explosive gases. Therefore, let us write an expression for this for the energy release and then let us put things together and view it in the light of some experimental results such that we can formulate a, a, a criterion for starting a detonation or initiating a detonation. Therefore, let us now presume yes I have a, a, a blast wave. Let us presume yes I have a blast wave which is formed of some size R s. Let us say the distance from the source is R s. As usual we make the same assumption rho naught is the density and all that. We also presume that the Mach number of this blast wave 
when it is at a distance r s is such that the value of m s is greater than between 4 or around between 4 and 5 such that chemical reactions take place behind it that is it is chemical reactions are taking place in this particular medium. Because the blast wave is strong we say well the time of the, the distance travelled is such that the chemical reactions have taken place. Let us presume well this is filled with chemical reactions and if it is filled with chemical reactions the chemical energy what is available within the blast wave chemical energy which is available is equal to the volume what is the volume 4 upon 3 pi into R s cube this is the volume into the density which is the mass into the chemical energy which is released. Let us say Q is so much let us say joules per kilogram is the chemical energy what is available over here. What does this chemical energy do? It increases the temperature of this medium that is the internal energy of this medium. It also increases the kinetic energy because the shock is moving it supplies some velocity to the, to the flow field. Therefore, this chemical energy gets translated we are not really considering now the effect of the initiation energy we are considering separately. We are considering just the effect of the chemical energy and what does it do? It increases the kinetic energy and the that is we are we look at a small uh, small segment over here let us say a, 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 a particular shell a spherical shell whose, whose density should be rho whose velocity could be u whose temperature could be t. We have been writing this in whenever we talked in terms of blast waves and therefore we say this is equal to integral of 0 to R s of the internal energy plus the kinetic energy over this particular medium that is dm over here and dm which I can again write it as equal to the surface area of this particular thing let us say 4 pi r square into dr into rho over here. We have derived this expression we have derived what this particular limit is and what did we derive it as equal to I could write internal energy as C v t kinetic energy is equal to u square by 2 and therefore, I have therefore rho u square this became p over gamma therefore p over gamma minus 1 into rho and therefore rho and rho got cancelled and we got this final expression as equal to i that is integral let, let, let me put it separately 4 pi into we, we got r, r s cubed into r s dot square into i over here and what was the value of i we said i is an integral is equal to 0 to 1 of f over gamma minus 1 that is the pressure into density of we, we had something like psi phi square divided by 2 into we had r by r s into d eta you will recall we had we said that this integral is around 0 0.423 or something for a medium like air. Therefore, we are able to get this relation that is 4 pi r s cubed into r s dot square into i and this comes from this particular expression and therefore, this is equal to this particular value and therefore, what is it I find mind you here rho, rho by rho naught I should have got a rho naught also over here and therefore, when I equate these two expressions what is it I get 4, 4 upon 3 pi whatever I have written here r s cubed into rho naught into q is equal to Four pi R s cube into rho zero coming over here R s dot square into i, where i is the integral constant. Therefore, I find four pi four pi cancels on both sides. Rho zero and rho zero gets cancelled. R s cube gets cancelled over here, and I get the value of R s dot square is equal to I I simply get it as Q divided by three into the integral particular expression. And now, if I want to write it in terms of Mach number square, I know Mach number of the shock, shock front behind which chemical reactions are occurring is equal to R s dot divided by A 0 or rather I get M s square is equal to Q divided by 3 i into A 0 square, where A 0 we said is around 330 meters per second. Therefore, this is from the chemical reactions what is taking place. Well, the blast when no chemical reactions are taking place it goes as per this particular expression 
And combining these two together, can I now say what is the value of the detonation kernel or the kernel of gas which can really form a detonation? Therefore, now I put these two things together. Well, I say I have m s square from as a function of r s for a given value of energy release and what happens? Well, the blast wave decays in an unreactive medium like this. When the medium gets to be reactive and provided I have sufficient quantity that means the time is sufficient for energy to get released, well the m s square could be something like this. This is for a detonation velocity that is equal to the value of m from the chemical energy release. This is from the decaying influence of a shock wave. That means the chemical reactions must be able to overcome the decaying influence of the shock wave and when the chemical energy release overcomes the decaying influence, what is going to happen? Well, it comes like this and gets into a shock and therefore, I can tell that well, the role of the energy release is initially to form a decaying shock wave, but if the decaying shock wave is greater than some limit, well, it gets into this and forms what we call as a detonation. Therefore, you know on this plot now I say well I want to include the different values of energy release and let us see how it will look like. If I have a very small energy release well it goes like this well by the time the critical distance is required to, to release the chemical energy the shock has decayed to a very low value well it cannot initiate well if the energy is very large well it can directly release the energy and it goes into a detonation. On the other way on the, in the extreme case that means this is E not large well the energy release is very small under some critical condition it is possible that the energy release as I have sketched by the orange line it comes to the ms value energy release takes over and drives a detonation and this is how we should be able to imagine or maybe have a think model on how to form a detonation. Therefore, to form a detonation I summarize here by saying it is necessary to form let us say a detonation kernel. I I still use the word kernel because we are very clear about it in case of a flame and this kernel size should be a minimum volume let us say R star and this R star must be formed by the time the shock decays to a critical strength m s and this R star at the value of m s star is what we could call as a detonation kernel and once I know a kernel volume I can always find out what is the energy which forms this kernel and I can find out my energy release. Therefore, without with before going further on the theoretical grounds let us take a look at some of the experiments and then calculate the energy release and I show a few experiment results before going forward and in the first slide over here. I show some experiments which were done at McGill University in late 60s and early 70s and what we find is in this case a laser spark is used to start a spherical blast wave. The medium used is low pressure acetylene oxygen system which is diluted with argon again and what we find is initially a blast wave is created at a small time let us say 1.6 microseconds. The shock wave or the blast wave moves forward it still moves forward at 8 microseconds and it keeps propagating out. This is the first circle what you see is the spherical uh, shell of the blast wave which is being formed. In this case it was cylindrical, but let us uh, let us assume a two dimensional geometry as the, the first circle is the blast circle that is the shock circle. You know behind the shock when the temperature is large chemical reactions occur and therefore, here you see behind it there is some chemical reactions occurring the shock weakens it takes more distance for the chemical reaction to take place. The shock further weakens you have the shock here chemical reactions in the second zone chemical that means the chemical reactions are further occurring away from the shock that means the chemical reactions are occurring far from the shock and these chemical reactions cannot go and supply energy to the shock because it is occurring much later. For the chemical reactions to supply energy to the shock what must happen let us take a look at it on the board. All what I am trying to say is well let us go back to the streak diagram with which we are familiar which we studied in the blast waves. You have the temperature axis time, time axis I am sorry you have the distance axis. 
well the blast wave gets formed like this in the limit it becomes a sound wave initially i have strong shock wave and what happens a particle entering over here is following the shock wave like this if the particle takes a long time to burn well it's going to burn over here and uh, since the when it burns over here the blast wave is already here it is not able to translate its energy here and keep pushing it like a piston moving a wave whereas if the wave is going to if the shock is sufficiently strong and if it is going to burn right over here the energy is going to feed into it maybe a particle entering here will feed into this and it will push this wave therefore i would like this this particular distance that means this particular distance or this particular distance to be as small as possible such that chemical energy can really push it if it if it is going to burn over here and it is going to be uh, say a far away from this zone of chemical reactions well the energy cannot really, really push it because it gets into the medium it cannot really go and push the push the shock wave like a piston pushing a wave therefore what happens is in this particular case the energy release is small and therefore you find the chemical reactions to decouple from the shock front let's go to the next case and examine in this case the energy is high well i form a shock here and the chemical reactions are occurring almost at the shock and therefore you know you find well this is the case in which i want you know the energy is sufficient to form a shock i also show the case wherein the critical condition that means initially i form a shock the chemical reactions occur at some distance away from the shock therefore it sort of decouples but then you know it really does not decouple like in the first case wherein it it the distance kept on increasing between the shock and chemical reactions what happens is at some particular distance it moves as a quasi steady that means both are moving together some instability sort of develop and therefore what is happening is the the whole thing becomes highly messy and the chemical reactions couple with it and i form a detonation this correspond seems to correspond to a critical case i can also show it in a streak picture wherein maybe when you have the shock that is the the blast wave is over here it travels forward you have the chemical reaction zone which are over here chemical reaction zone over here blast wave over here you know that two keep on increasing in distance and therefore the energy is insufficient to form a detonation kernel of some minimum size over here the energy release is large i have a strong shock wave mind you here the velocity is much higher chemical reactions occur just at the shock front and drive it as a detonation this corresponds to the critical case where initially there is a decoupling and then i have both going together and then forming a detonation therefore these experiments are suggestive of the following well i have mach number versus the distance if the energy release is low well i by the time a core of chemical reactions is formed the the shock wave has decayed to low velocities and i really cannot form a detonation if the energy release is large e0 we find this is the this is the direction of energy release if the energy release is large well i am able to form a detonation under the critical conditions it seems to decay to a smaller value and then maybe go at at a constant speed between the two there is a constant zone of separation and then it transits into a detonation we still have to take a look at it but all what we are saying is when the energy release exceeds a threshold value i am able to form a detonation and this detonation travels at a constant speed which we said is known as chapman jugay speed and which we have to still model it but we say well under certain conditions well uh, it decays to a smaller mach number and under critical conditions and then transits into a detonation i want to put all these things into a small model and therefore i first try to say based on experiments and based on the considerations which we discussed before looking at these three experimental results we say well initial phase is maybe due to the energy release the blast wave decays and if the if the uh, energy release is such that i can form a detonation kernel under critical conditions wherein i am just able to maintain the distance between the shock and and the chemical reactions uh, to be small 
wherein they are both quasi steady and the chemical energy can drag the blast wave well i can i can find the critical energy required for a detonation under these conditions i say well the distance traveled by the blast before chemical reactions couple, couple is what we call as a detonation kernel and why why do we need this well we need a minimum time for chemical reactions to occur which we talked as the induction time you will recall well on time you have the time axis over here maybe the temperature over here and what is it we say well the chemical reactions have to take place before the maximum temperatures are reached well this is this is about the background of the experiments and therefore now we can write the expressions down we found yes we we wrote an expression for chemical energy release when all the chemical energy is released but now we find well there must be a distance that means shock is over here it takes a definite time for chemical reactions to occur therefore when the shock is at distance rs i have a, a distance delta corresponding to the induction distance over which shock travels this is the chemical energy release well this is the energy release from the source over here and these two this plus this plus the initial energy release is the total energy release in the medium which using the same principles what i illustrated for the source and chemical energy release i can write that the mach number of the front that is the shock wave front which is generated by the chemical energy release and by the energy release from the source now i put it as es or e not over here is given by this particular expression and i have the value i coming here i combine the e not and q over here i said it's also a function of the induction time it's not q by 3a not square which i just derived on the board it is also a function of this particular distance over here and i we said is the energy integral which we studied earlier under blast waves which is equal to the kinetic energy and internal energy of the shock gases divided by the kinetic energy if the entire mass of gases were to move at the shock speed well this is the formulation of a theory and let's see what i get i write the equation again as m square is equal to 1 over i source energy term over here the chemical energy term over here well i can even neglect this because the initial internal energy e not we have been always neglecting it over a blast wave it's not necessary to consider and what is it i now tell myself well the decaying influence of the shock is due to the source if it was in an inert medium ms square is equal to 1 over i into this particular source energy term it decays as rs cube and this keeps decaying and the chemical energy release must be able to overcome this decaying influence or rather this must be equal to this for the case when the detonation should be formed because what should happen let me again go back to the board i have some energy which is deposited in a particular explosive gas i am forming a shock wave because of this energy which is liberated if there is no chemical reactions occurring the mach number of the shock front which is formed as distance moves will keep decaying what does the chemical energy do we did this calculation now we have put an induction time a time for chemical reactions we say it takes place after a particular time over here this we called as delta in our particular uh, slide which we saw what it does is it it sort of overcomes this decaying influence and tries to push it forward at constant velocity all what we are saying is the chemical energy release must be able to overcome the decaying influence and make it into a steady propagating uh, front at a given detonation velocity and this is the requirement and therefore we say well the chemical energy release must be able to dominate over the decaying influence and drive a detonation and therefore coming back to the slide we say well the source energy term must be equal to this for the critical condition well the critical condition is instead of zero to rs now i say well rs star is the detonation kernel delta is the induction time or induction distance behind it therefore i have 1 minus delta over rs star into the same you will recall this is the density ratio this is r by rs over here and therefore i can write this expression as q into 1 minus delta over rs divided by rs cubed into q plus 3 what was q you will recall we said that the density ratio behind the a uh, uh, density ratio behind a blast wave let's again go back you you had a shock front over here we said well 
at the front what happens you have the initial density is rho 0 in the unburnt medium over here. You have the density increase to rho s and the value of rho s was gamma plus 1 divided by gamma minus 1 for a strong shock for a weaker shock well I have 2 over m s square over here and what happened it, it decayed down we got the slope of this we said rho within this blast wave divided by the value of rho s is equal to we had r that is at any distance divided by r s was equal to q we found out q is a large number around 15 most of the mass is concentrated at the front and that is the value of q and if we put this we get well the equality between energy release and chemical energy release and we are able to now get the value of r star and from that if we calculate the value of the energy required we find that for a stoichiometric mixture of acetylene and oxygen is between 0.5 to 3 joules depending on the pressure at atmospheric pressure it is it is around around 2 joules or so for hydrogen oxygen mixture it is around 3 joules maybe the variations is between 0.5 to 3 joules for stoichiometric propane and oxygen the energy required is around 100 joules for stoichiometric propane with oxygen. If I consider air it is very much higher, but we found whenever we talk in terms of propane air mixture for the energy required to start a flame was only 1 millijoule, whereas in this case it is several kilojoules because here I am talking in terms of propane oxygen for propane air as I said it is much higher and therefore you know the energy is of the order of 100 kilojoules for propane air and therefore, we find that the amount of energy required to start a detonation is way way above the energy required for to start a flame. Having said that I just show in this particular table the energy required to start a detonation in hydrogen oxygen mixture we said around 6 joules hydrogen air compared to 6 joules you require 3 kilo joules because of the inert effects you know the thing is that the induction times are larger and that is why it becomes 3 kilojoules. Well, 3 kilojoules compared compares with something like 0 0.018 millijoules for the flame. When we talk of acetylene oxygen 5 joules, when we talk of acetylene air it is around 200 joules. When we take talk in terms of methane oxygen the energy required is around 100 joules while with methane air the energy required is something like 100,000 kilojoules which means we are telling that to start a detonation we require extremely large values of energy. The question is well you know that means we have said yes we have formulated a theory let us let us go back and take a look at what we have said so far. Yes we have understood what a detonation is we also know yes the energy required to start a detonation that is E0 joules is very much larger because I need a larger kernel of detonation compared to a small quenching thickness kernel for a flame and E0 is something like almost like 10 to the power 4 times in several cases 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 6 times what is required to start a flame. Therefore, immediately we will say well to start a detonation in a gas is going to be very difficult well it need not be so we will see that, but the, the point made is if I have to start a shock wave and form a detonation I require larger energy release. This is true not only for explosive gas mixtures, it is also true for explosives like let us say any explosive substances which we will study after 3 or 4 uh, classes like solid explosives maybe liquid explosives. The energy required to directly form are larger because what we require is to be able to form a shock wave which should couple with the chemical reactions. But this as I said need not always be, need not be possible because in practice you know the type of sparks we get in, in accidental cases are maybe small millijoules of energy and if I have something like an explosive gas over here it is more likely to form a flame and not really a detonation. But then let us take another look at some of the results we are taking a look you know if I have something like gas which is flowing in a medium. And say, say some in this particular case I just consider let us say uh, a, a gas flowing through a particular hole over here when it flows over here some vortex is formed something like a starting vortex is formed something like a like, like uh, 
like a shape over here, something like a mushroom shape is formed. And such starting vortex have been widely dealt with in literature, such as uh, uh, this particular author, he published a paper in physics of fluids on the starting vortex. But what I want to say is whenever I have a flame, let us say I have a flame in a mixture. That means I have a pipeline over here, I have a gas mixture, I form a flame which travels slowly. You know the flame is like a piston and when I have a flame it pushes the gases ahead of it and the gases therefore acquire a velocity. That means the unburned mixture ahead of a flame gets a velocity and if the flame becomes turbulent it moves at higher speed and the gas ahead of the flame which is unburned moves at high velocity. And in fact, if I have some blockages or surface roughness on the walls, what is going to happen? This high subsonic flow speed will create expansion waves because the flow becomes sonic due to the expansion of the gases behind the blockage. And I have expansion waves which get reflected. I have something like a recirculation zone, maybe a, a, a vortex is formed over here. I have a shear layer which separates the zone of separation from the free stream zone. The, the expansion waves come and reflect on the shear layer and since the impedance over here is or the mechanical impedance of the separated layer is less than the impedance of the air of the gas which is already processed or the free stream flow of gases, the expansion waves re get reflected as compression waves. See we saw this, we you remember we had the Z value, we talked of gases moving into a higher impedance medium, a lower impedance medium. In a lower impedance medium, the compression waves reflect as expansion waves, the expansion waves reflect as compression waves and these expansion waves merge together and form a shock wave. That means, they form a shock pattern and behind this therefore, you have all these multiple shock structures taking place and because these are all not, these could be either a mark stem shock, we will consider this in the next class. And we also have maybe oblique shocks and because of this the flow becomes extremely, extremely turbulent ahead of the flame itself. Now similarly, I show a Schlieren picture, you have a blockage here, you have the gases flowing, well you have the shock waves which are being formed, you have a shock wave at the wall, you have the reflected shock wave over here, an incident shock wave, you have a reflected shock wave, you, you have a, either it could be a regular reflection, it could be a mark type of reflection. Therefore, you have all these shocks which are possible and these things what they do is they create high intensity turbulence, you know because you have flow directions being changing, you have slip streams over here, you have very high intensity turbulence over here and this high intensity turbulence and also the length scale of turbulence also increases behind the lead shock wave which is in the unburned gases. Therefore, you form a very high turbulent flame which further pushes the gas at high velocity and since you have the length scale of turbulence which is large, you have the flame which is engulfing the unburned gases and when you have the flame which is engulfing the unburned gases, it sort of implodes or it, it, it sort of crumbles together, it cavitates sort of and energy is released and this energy release could form a shock wave and then I could have a detonation. Therefore, we say well, this is what happens, I have the gas which is flowing, I, I, I have the turbulent structure which is being formed, it becomes highly turbulent ahead of it and ultimately I have something like a zone of unburned gases which, which is enclosed by a, a, a particular shock wave and this shock wave implodes and this thing generates a, 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 a strong shock wave which can now couple with the chemical reactions to form what we call as a detonation wave. Therefore, we tell ourselves well it is also possible for us to think in terms of a situation wherein I form a flame and this flame becomes highly corrugated and ahead of the flame in the unburned gas mixture I have maybe the velocities are high and as it becomes more and more turbulent this flame becomes more and more corrugated until maybe it, it forms it, it is able to engulf the unburned gases and when these unburned gases they auto explode, I generate a shock wave and now the chemical reactions take place behind this shock wave because it is quite strong and I get a detonation. Therefore, the formation of a detonation could be from two sources namely the direct formation of a blast wave which couples with chemical reactions. Therefore, I say well 
a detonation can be formed by directly from the ignition source which forms a strong blast wave which I call as direct initiation or I could also form in which case I could form a flame and the flame pushes the unburned gases ahead of it forms a turbulent gas mixture in which a turbulent flame is formed. The turbulent flame can travel at high speeds, it forms a very turbulent flame brush and this brush if it is able to engulf some gases, well it forms a shock wave and then this shock wave forms a detonation in which case it is an indirect way of forming a detonation which we call as deflagration. Uh, another a word used for flame is de deflagration that means a constant pressure flame or a pressure slightly reduces across a flame we call flame as a deflagration to detonation transition. And this is abbreviated as DDT. Therefore, two ways of forming a detonation is direct initiation. We found that the energy releases are rather high. We know how to calculate the energy release. But in this case, I have a flame which forms a detonation and the distance required from the energy release source. Initially, I form a flame. Then after some distance, I form this. The distance required is called as the run up distance. And most of the accidental explosions or explosions which occur with solid explosives, with uh, uh, liquid explosives, with gaseous mixtures are from flame transiting to this and we will discuss this maybe in the next class again. To summarize then, I would like to say the following. Well, this shows the streak picture. Initially, I have the flame moving over here, low velocity. Over here, the conditions for detonation are formed. Well, a detonation propagates at constant velocity thereafter. And to, to just sum up, well, the run up distance is for deflagration to detonation transition. It is different from direct initiation wherein the energy source formed directly at detonation, the, the initiation source forms the flame which later transits to a detonation. And in most of the explosive gas mixtures like we remember we talked of this in a particular factory. Now, there was an accidental leakage of propane gas. It formed a propane gas mixture. This was in Wisconsin and what happened is this propane gas mixture interacted with the uh, 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 a flame got formed. The flame pushed the gases ahead of it and the gases which were traveling at some velocity interacted with the machines in this particular machining facility. That means, you have the lathe machine it acted as an obstruction or a blockage. The, the gases ahead of it moved towards the particular blockage and it created conditions wherein a turbulent flame got formed, further high velocity gases got formed and gradually a very turbulent flame got formed ultimately it transited into a detonation. We will consider some cases in the next class and what we do in the next class is therefore, we will see yes we have learned something about detonation about how to start a detonation, the two methods of forming a detonation and what, what we should be looking at is at the structure of a detonation. We will see it is not so beautiful, it is not one dimensional, it is a multi dimensional detonation and then we will take a look at some theories of detonation. Well, thank you.